Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. We're making our way through the Ten Commandments, and we're almost all the way through. In fact, today we're going to take a look at the Ninth Commandment, and it's one I believe is very timely for the day and age in which we live. The commandment is to not bear false witness against our neighbor. We're going to take a look in a moment at what that meant in its original context and some ways that we can apply it today. But now more than ever, we live in an age where we have the opportunity to speak into situations of life. And I believe the principles that we're going to look at today apply, first of all, to the actual words that we say, the words that come out of our mouths. But we also live in this technological age in, uh, with an opportunity to also express ourselves uh, through emails, through texts, on social media. There's so many other ways for us to use words. And um, as believers in Jesus, it's very important that we constantly, always take great pains to make sure that our words are filled with truth and not tainted by any hint of falsehood whatsoever. So we're going to take a look at the commandment, and we're going to look at some ways to apply that now in our New Testament age. So get ready to dig into scriptures. We'll be looking at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. First, I'm going to lead us in prayer. So join me as we pray. Holy Father, uh, you are a God of truth. All truth comes from you. Uh, truth emanates from you. In you, there is no falsehood whatsoever. You are nothing but truth. You are pure in truth. Uh, you sent us your son, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And he told us that the truth would set us free. And then upon Jesus returning to heaven, you have filled us as his followers with the spirit of truth. So truth is very important to you. You enable us, Lord, to, to live in truth and, and to, uh, to be able to share truth. You give us the blessed privilege to tell the most important truth that there is and that, that God is in his son reconciling the world to himself. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand from your word today how our words, whether spoken or whether typed or posted uh, on some sort of digital format, how our words are so important and we need to make sure that our words are always filled with truth. For it's in the name of the one who is true, faithful and true, our Savior, your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now let's turn to our scriptures. Here we are in our scripture for the day, Exodus 20, 16, which says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. As we try to do with each of these Ten Commandments, we've tried to identify a guiding principle behind each commandment that helps us in the New Testament age apply this, this truth uh, because it tells us about the character and nature of God, how we can apply that truth to our lives in the New Testament age today. So the guiding principle that we have here is that our relationship with Jesus, who is the truth, should lead us to always speak truthfully about others. There's always this, um, this idea of, is there ever the right time to lie? Uh, is it okay to tell a lie in order to preserve a life? Uh, if you've read The Hiding Place, uh, the story uh, written by Corey Tim Boom, and the story of, of people who um, wanted to hide Jews when the Nazis were trying to purge all Jews from Eastern Europe, uh, you know, if officials came, you know, obviously and asked where they're there, that would have been an appropriate time to have, have lied and to have, you know, said, no, they're not here. There are those times in which, um, I'm going to put it this way, concealing truth For a greater good. There are times when concealing truth for a greater good is acceptable. In fact, there are times that it is optimal to do that. There are times that it's, in, that it's okay to do that. What Exodus 2016 is talking about is not 
a greater good, but instead it is dealing with a, a selfish good. Let's read the verse again. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, a couple of things I want us to, to, to notice about this. The word false here carries with it a connotation of deception. Now, understand that in, in their culture, um, they settled any civil disagreement by coming before the town elders. And both sides would get to tell their story. And uh, much like in, in our uh, Western court of law, uh, both defendants and plaintiffs uh, alike have the opportunity to call witnesses to share what they see or what they know. And uh, so the concept here was that when your a case is being pled before the town elders, that it's never permissible to deceive with the story that you tell, whether about you, about someone who has something against you or against whom you have something, or even if you're just a witness to it, not to bear a deceptive witness. So it carries with it the idea not of greater good, but instead of a selfish good. So you notice where the motive is. So the question that we asked earlier, is it ever right to conceal the truth for a greater good? Yes, because it's for the greater good. What this commandment talks about, and when the scripture talks about lying, it's talking about um, looking after ourselves at the expense of others. It's, it's preserving us at the expense of others. And that's the core of this commandment. Now, a second thing to notice is that our neighbor well, you know, the New Testament definition of neighbor is anyone with whom we make contact. Uh, we think of neighbor as people who live around us, but Jesus' concept of the neighbor was anyone that God brings into our path for any reason whatsoever. So you might say, that a New Testament statement of this in a positive light is always be totally truthful about people. Always be totally truthful about people or Or be quiet. Um, now we're going to look at some more about this truthfulness and even if we know truth do we have to say truth. We're going to look at this concept of not playing with the truth in dealing with other people. All right so what I want us to look at I want us to look at three ways we play with the truth about others. First of all we play with the truth about others when we tell Let's just face it, we sometimes tell blatant lies, very blatant lies. We just tell stuff that is not the case. Now, two verses in the New Testament that I've chosen, we could look at several. Ephesians chapter 4, 25, Paul tells the Ephesian Christians, therefore, having put away falsehood, this is something we're supposed to take off, do away with. And this is in the context of, of, of this new life. We've put away the old life, and this falsehood was part of the old us, the, the before, the but God of Ephesians chapter 2. When we were lost in our sin, when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, that's when we dealt in falsehood. Instead, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then he told the Colossian Christians something very similar. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have, there's this terminology, put off the old self with its practices, and you have put on, so you've put off, now you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We've talked about this before, how 
um, we call this process sanctification. After we're born again, the Holy Spirit works in our life to little by little make us more like Jesus. We are being transformed to Jesus's image. We're being made to look like him. Uh, Romans 8, 29, those he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is at work in us to make us look like Jesus. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Jesus came to be truth. He is truth personified. So if we are being transformed into the image of Jesus, we're being transformed into the image of one whose very nature is truth, then truth is going to be very characteristic of us. And that's the good news of this new life we have in Christ. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, making us agents of truth. And when we yield to the Holy Spirit and we allow him to do that work, we don't speak in blatant lies. We speak in truth. And if we can't speak in truth, we hold our peace. And there are even times, we're going to see this in just a moment, where speaking the truth is not even appropriate. We need to just be quiet. But we, we play with the truth when we tell blatant lies. And if we're honest about it, there are time all of, all, times all of us have been tempted to, to any time we repeat something, we aren't sure about. Because see, the truth or untruth of an issue does not depend on the person who is sharing the information. Something is true or not true intrinsically on its own, on its factual basis. So if I repeat something and it turns out that what I repeated is not true, I have repeated an untruth, whether or not I did it intentionally. I repeated an untruth. So if I can't verify the factuality of something, if I haven't seen it with my eyes, heard it with my ears, or experienced it in my own life, if I cannot validate the factualness of something, I have no business sharing it. Because if it turns out not be factual, then I have perpetuated a lie. I've told a lie. Whether I intended to or not, our intention and what we thought we were telling has nothing to do with the fact that something is true or not. Now, I, I want to stop here for a moment because I want to make sure that we get this. When we tell something that turns out to be not true, even if we thought it was true, we have still told something that is untrue, and we're responsible for our telling of it. So make sure, verify the factuality of things that you share. Have you seen it with your eyes, heard it with your ears, experienced it in your own life? We tell blatant lies. Second thing we do is sometimes we deal in half truths. Now, you, this is a story from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Abraham and Sarah were sojourning uh, in the land, and they came to a place where Abimelech, the king of Gerar, they were afraid of him. And so Abraham had this little plan with Sarah. Don't tell them you're my wife. Tell them you're my sister, because if if they know you're my wife, they may kill me so that they can then take you. And so she agreed to it. We see here in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 20 that that's exactly what they did. Abraham said of Sarah, she is my sister. Now, here's the thing about that. That is not completely a lie. That is a half truth. Because Sarah, Sarah was indeed the half sister of Abraham. As you read through the narrative, you find that out. They they had the same father, but not the same mother. Chances are there were several years between them. We know that early on in the life of the patriarchs, uh, it was early in the history of the world, they married within a family like that. The gene pool made it such that it was not as uh, great a health issue as it is now. 
regardless of all of that, the truth was, yeah, she was sister, but she was also wife. And wife was the more important, exclusive relationship. Abraham had Sarah do that to protect his own life because he was afraid his life was at danger. He was being very selfish. It was really kind of cowardly that he put his wife in danger of becoming an adulteress, possibly being raped, all that he would preserve his own life. It really kind of is, it was not one of Abraham's finer moments. Thankfully, uh, we know that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We know Abraham to eventually be a man of great, great faith. Um, but we see that even a man of great faith like Abraham had his moments and he dealt in half truth. If we're not careful, there are only part, we only tell parts of the truth that are beneficial to us. And we don't tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about a matter. We only share certain parts of the story. So be careful as you share something that, that you're telling all of the story. And then the third way that we play with the truth is gossip. Now, I want to read this. It's kind of a long passage of scripture that we have here, but it's from Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. And I want you to watch something here. All right, so in Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking about how creation has turned against God and is living as though God doesn't exist. He says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. Now, I want to, I want to pay attention to this phrase, gave them up to a but debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Look at some of these other words that he gives us here. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. So he's talking about people that are that are debased in their mind. They've not acknowledged God. God has let them go in their sinfulness. They are just, they're spiraling down this horrible road. And he's talking about, I mean, when we look at these things are horrible, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Gossip in the same list with envy, murder, strife, deceit, slanderers, haters of God, gossips in the same list as people who are haters of God? Look, so you, you see where we're going with the list, but look, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, such things as gossip. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. I, I hope I've, 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 I have emphasized enough this truth. Gossip is not funny. It is not innocent. It is not even inevitable. Now, this is one of my soapboxes. So I'm going to try not to just kind of stake a put a stake in the ground and stay here for too long. But this is, gossip is the besetting sin of the 21st century Western church. Now, something, I, I, want, I want to take a moment and define gossip. Gossip can be either true or not true. Gossip is telling anything true or not true, telling anything without permission to tell it. It's not ours to tell. Let me just state it this way. I think this is a pretty good way. We need to understand there's an ownership of news. There's an ownership of a story. 
And if it didn't happen to me and didn't involve me, I don't have ownership of it. And I'm not allowed to tell it without permission. Now, I want to also say this. I want to write this because I want you to see it. You can't stop gossip. coming to you, okay? But you can and you should stop gossip going through you. You can't stop somebody from telling you gossip, but gossip can stop with you. At least that that particular trail of gossip can stop with you. When you hear something that somebody shared, they didn't have ownership to share, then you don't repeat it. If there's one thing that I could snap my fingers and do away with in the world today, it would be gossip. I personally have been bitten by gossip, both true and untrue, and I have seen gossip tear churches apart, families apart, people apart, and folks, it's just got to stop, and uh, I've lost friends, and I've made people angry over calling this out, and I will continue to until the day I die. In fact, who knows, one day I may die because I did this. Um, but it is my number one pet peeve in the world today. There's ownership of news. There's ownership of a story. And if you don't have it, then you just need to be quiet. Now, let me sum everything up I've said today by encouraging you. And you may or may not be able to see it over my shoulder here. When I go back to the full screen, you'll be able to see it. Um, I want to encourage you to think before you speak. And we use the words, the letters to the word think to remind us. The first question to ask is what I'm going to say, do I, can I verify that it's true? Can I verify it? Do I know this is true? Not did I hear that it was true or suppose that it was true or even would like for it to be true or suspect that it's true? I have a pretty good idea that it's true. Am I 100%? Can I 100% verify this is true? Is it true? H, is it helpful? By saying this, am I being helpful? Or am I being selfish? Am I making myself look good? Or am I causing harm to somebody I don't like? Or am I, am I making it look like I know things and I'm somebody important because I know things? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Will my telling this cause someone to grow closer to Jesus? Will this inspire others to godly living? Hebrews 10 24 and 25 uh, talk about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And it talks about that we should spur one another on to love and good works. Is what I'm going to say going to inspire someone? The end? Is it necessary? First of all, is it necessary to be said? Second, is it necessary for me to say it? And three, does it need to be said now and here? There's a time and a place. Would this be better handled in private? Could this be better said a different way? Do I really need to be the one to say it? And then the K is kind. Can I say this in a kind and gentle way? 
you know what, if we'll ask ourselves before we post, before we hit share on a Facebook post, ask ourselves these four questions, these five questions, before we send that email, uh, before we make that post, is it necessary? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Now, I don't know if I've come across a little bit fussy today, and uh, if it is, it's because this this issue is very, I don't know, it's just, it's a very important issue to me. Because if we play fast and loose with the truth, we lose the credibility to share the most important truth that there is to share, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we gossip a lot, if we can't be trusted with the truth, even if we're, even if in our good intentions, we become known for sharing things that turn out to not be true, why would anyone believe what we share about Jesus is true? So let me encourage you, on the basis of the ninth commandment, bearing false witness against your neighbors more than just causing them trouble in court by testifying, lying under oath about them. It's about the way we live our lives. Value truth, care about truth, hold truth close to your heart, only share truth when it's helpful, when it can inspire, when it's necessary, and when you can do it in a kind way. And you'll find that God will use you and use your words to point people to Jesus. So I hope you take this in the spirit it is intended. I want to leave you with that one last quote because this is something I want you to work on practicing. You can't stop gossip from coming to you, but you can and should stop gossip from going through you. Verify that whatever you share is true. Verify it. Don't just think it is. And then second of all, ask yourself the fake questions. Do I really, really, really need to share this? Can I tell the whole truth or should I just keep my mouth shut? God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next time.